Our gospel reading for this morning comes from Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, we need you to speak to us. I ask that you would speak through me, and perhaps even in spite of me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Think for a moment about how often you ask yourself the question, what time is it? What time is it? Something I think about all the time. I think about it when I first wake up in the morning, uh, when I'm eating breakfast, when I'm walking to class, when I'm working on assignments. Well, it's time to go to bed. The way we answer that question fundamentally shapes our lives. Am I going to jump straight out of bed, or am I going to hit the snooze button? Uh, am I going to whip up some eggs for breakfast, or am I going to grab a protein bar on the go? I park in the green lot, so every morning i got to decide, do I need to kind of shuffle run to class, or can I walk and enjoy the scenery of campus? I know we've all experienced sitting down to do some readings for class, and you have to decide, am I going to skim these readings, or am I going to read them very closely? <laughs> and then at the end of the day, you know, when all the work is done, I have to decide, am I going to stay up and watch some TV or something, or am I going to go to bed? All of these ordinary, everyday decisions are shaped by that question that's always there, pressing in on us. What time is it? So how do we know what time it is? I think it's more complicated than just looking at a clock or even a calendar. Think about some of the big, bigger decisions that we face throughout our lives. Is it time for me to get married? Is it time for me to have a baby? Is it time for me to switch careers? Is it time for me to get a divorce? Is it time for me to have an abortion? A clock alone is not going to help you to figure these things out. A calendar alone is not going to help you figure these things out. So we've all adopted other senses of time, other ways of keeping time that guide our lives. They shape how we live and, and they shape who we are. So I wonder what sense of time guides the way that you live. And I wonder where you got that sense of time. In Mark's Gospel, from which our reading comes this morning, uh, Jesus' central mission is to tell the world what time it is. There's no baby Jesus in Mark. Uh, there's no wise men or, or shepherds. Uh, the adult Jesus just kind of bursts onto the scene from out of nowhere. Uh, he shows up, he gets baptized by John, and almost immediately he just starts preaching. The time has come, Jesus proclaims. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So you see right up front, Mark tells us, Jesus is here to tell the world what time it is. It's time for the kingdom of God. It's time for new wineskins. It's time for healing and feasting. It's time for suffering and death. But nobody gets it. Right? Nobody understands. 
Uh, Jesus goes around proclaiming the kingdom in word and deed. The demons actually do seem to understand, but no one else gets it at all. It takes Jesus' own disciples like eight chapters, it's like half of Mark, before they even figure out that Jesus is the Messiah. And even then, they still really don't understand. So they're always coming to him with really dumb questions. Like, uh, hey Jesus, um, can you do whatever we ask? Or, uh, hey Jesus, um, can we be second in command? Can we be like your number two? So understandably, Jesus spends most of Mark's gospel in a pretty bad mood. <laughs> He's always telling people to shut up about him and to stop asking him stupid questions. <laughs> but finally, after 12 chapters of frustration and confusion and ignorance, the disciples finally come to Jesus with a really good question. It's the week before Passover. Uh, Jesus has become a, a very popular miracle worker slash healer, despite his sometimes prickly bedside manner. Um, because of these healings and miracles that he does, and probably not because of his charisma, uh, people have begun to think that Jesus just might be the long-awaited Messiah. So when he makes his climactic ride into Jerusalem for the Passover, the crowd is at fever pitch, and the authorities are on high alert. Jesus gets inside the city, and he marches straight to the temple. And as soon as he gets there, he starts smashing the place up. He's flipping tables. He's screaming out angry Old Testament quotes. And when he's done with that, he turns on the crowd that's gathered around him. And he starts condemning every single group that he can see represented there. Pharisees, scribes, chief priests, elders, Herodians, I mean, you name it. He tells them all that they're wicked, or they're stupid, or both. <laughs> well, the crowd is just eating this up. And the authorities are scrambling, trying to figure out how they're going to kill Jesus. And just when the intensity of the moment can't get any higher, when the climax of Mark's whole gospel just seems imminent, Jesus just leaves. He just walks out. On the way out of the temple, an oblivious disciple looks up and marvels at the size and magnificence of the building. And Jesus says, oh yeah, take a good look. Because it's all coming down. Every last stone. Well, the confused Disciples follow Jesus out of Jerusalem and over next door to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus takes a seat looking out over the temple. We can imagine that he's still muttering angry things under his breath. After a while, the, the inner core of disciples, James and, and Peter and John and Andrew, these ones that Jesus had called first, they finally worked up the gumption to go ask their angry, irritated teacher question. Uh, hey Jesus, um, when when are all these things going to happen? When's the temple going to get thrown down? And, uh, and what sign should we be looking for? In other words, they were asking, Hey Jesus, what time is it? You see, um, we thought that that was like your moment back there in the temple. Uh, we, we think you might have missed your time, uh, but clearly our sense of time must be off. So, so help us out, Jesus. What time is it? Well, apparently that's like the best question that anybody has asked Jesus in the entire <laughs> book. Uh, his answer takes up the rest of chapter 13. Is Jesus' longest monologue in Mark by far. It's like... He was just waiting for someone to ask him this question, and so uh, when they do, he just pounces on it. And he launches into this long, apocalyptic oration about what time it is. But Jesus' answer is typically elusive and un unclear. It's the kind of answer that Jesus just loves 
to give. It's the beginning of the end, Jesus explains. Or is it the end of the beginning? You see, we can't quite tell. Uh, it's like, and, what, and what's more, Jesus actually warns us against trying too hard to figure it out. It's like Jesus wants his followers to stay stuck in eschatological tension. It's the time of the exile. It's the time of exodus. It's the time of woe. It's the time of blessing. It's the time of hell. It's the time of heaven. Well, after constructing this strange, unnerving, paradoxical sense of time for his disciples... Jesus leaves them with one final command. Watch, he says. Watch. What time is it? The world has many ways of answering that question, but we're the church. And so we don't get to decide for ourselves what time it is. Jesus tells us what time it is. And it seems that Jesus has decided to place his church right at the intersection of the already and the not yet. It's like we're living on God's time in the midst of the world's time. We're kind of paradoxical people, standing between eternity and finitude, between life and death. That, brothers and sisters, that is a dangerous place to stand. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be earthquakes. There will be famines. I recently watched uh, the movie Romero, which of course is based on the true story of um, Archbishop Oscar Romero. Maybe some of you guys have seen it. Uh, Romero was an archbishop in El Salvador in the late 1970s. And when he became archbishop, he began to speak out against the Salvadorian government uh, because it was violently oppressing its own people. And uh, throughout the movie, Romero goes to greater and greater personal risk as he becomes more and more vocal against the government's policies. So, uh, understandably, he very quickly becomes an enemy of the state. And you can kind of feel within the movie that with each scene, his assassination becomes more and more inevitable. In the final scene of the movie, Romero's in a, a small church. He's leading the mass. And at the same time, his assassin is making his way to the church. He's riding a motorcycle and he's got a giant gun strapped to his back. The assassin gets to the church and uh, he walks and he enters the back very quietly and he stands in the doorway aiming his gun straight at Romero. Well, at that point in the service, Romero's in the middle of the Eucharistic prayer. There's this suspenseful moment where Romero stares past his unsuspecting congregation directly into the eyes of his murderer. But Romero doesn't panic. He doesn't flee. He just finishes the Eucharistic prayer, lifting the sacrament for all to see. And at that precise moment, a shot rings out, and Romero falls dead on the floor. It's dangerous, standing at the intersection of the already and the not yet. But it's also a joyful place to stand. There will be healing and, and feasting. There will be rejoicing. And laughter. I was recently asked to do the children's moment um, in the church where I work for the Sunday morning service. And I was told that I should prepare a little lesson for the kids on Exodus 25 through 40. Which uh, you'll remember, yeah, the ones of you are laughing now. Uh, you'll remember that's where God is telling the Israelites in excruciating detail how he wants them to build the tabernacle. 
So I kind of hate doing the children's moment anyways. And then they assign me what I think is the most boring part of all of scripture. So I didn't really know what I was going to do. But finally I decided uh, I would open this little lesson uh, just by asking the kids if they were going to build a house for God, how would they build it? And, and what kind of stuff would they want to be sure and put in the house for God? Well, the first kid shouts out, strawberries! <laughs> of course, the congregation laughs, and I tried to smile politely. <laughs> the second kid shouts out, a chimney! So I'm like, great, you've got God confused with Santa Claus. This is, <laughs> this is good. Something I, I really should have taken a different approach to this lesson. Uh, but then I notice in the, the back of this little crowd of kids, um, there's this little girl, she must have been no more than four years old, um, cute as she could be, short blonde hair, but it was done up in pigtails, you know, and, uh, and she raised her hand. So at that point, I was like, I should probably stop, you know, letting these kids talk. But um, <laughs> reluctantly, I called on her. And as soon as I called on her, she got this big smile on her face. And she started giggling. And she said, well, if we're going to build a house for God, it has to have bread. It has to have bread. This little four-year-old theologian had come to recognize God's presence in our church's breaking of bread and the sharing of the cup. She'd come to know God as the gracious host of our meals. God as the giver of bread. So in that moment, she reminded our church that the intersection of the already and the not yet is a joyful place. A place where God comes to meet with us, and to eat with us. Jesus has made his church a strange people, a people stuck in eschatological tension, a people living on God's time in the midst of the world's time. We are Oscar Romero staring straight into the face of death. We are that four-year-old child rejoicing in the presence of God. We are strange people because we have been given a strange sense of time. Thanks be to God.